Greg, it's good to see you this morning. And you, though. You doing good okay? You. I'm doing very well, thanks. Yeah, excellent. Progress has been excellent, actually. I'm curious, uh, you've now had your diaphragm pacer in now for about three weeks or so, uh, and things sound like they're progressing really well. What I'm interested in is um, just understanding what your sort of total respiratory routine is uh, during the day. Well, it's uh, changed since I first had the operation when I uh, first uh, face reactivated. A uh, day or two after the operation, I was on it for about two and a half, three, four minutes at a time, and over the last three and a half weeks, my typical time on the pacer has increased to at least 30 minutes. So this is your training program, right? Yes, we're doing a training, what we refer to it as a trial. But uh, uh, Most days I'm averaging 30 minutes per session. My, my longest session yesterday morning was 50 minutes, so it's really working quite Excellent. Well. Uh, yesterday morning I was getting my morning bath and shave done. I actually forgot that I wasn't on a ventilator. Mm -hmm. It's uh, from my perspective. The, the breathing on it is almost seamless. Okay, that's so it terrific. Well. Yeah. Do you notice that um, you're better able to smell or taste if you're on oh, the yes, pacer? Yes, yeah. and I've had a couple of nurses do the smell test and they, they'll hold my deodorant under my nose or they'll bring in flowers, that type of thing. And uh, the ability to smell has increased dramatically. It's uh, made a big difference. Which smells or tastes better, the hospital food or the food <laughs> your family brings in? Uh, that's pretty straightforward. It's the food my family bring it. The, the, the in. So, you know, you're talking about the, the pacer, but there's, I think, many aspects to your respiratory care, some of which you were doing perhaps a bit more before the pacer went in. I'm curious how much of that you're doing now in a, in a daytime. Uh, during the day when I'm on the pacer, in fact, we just introduced this. In the last three days, I have the mouthpiece available. Okay. To all memory. And it's, it's being used largely as a, uh, as a safety backup. When I was first um, on the PACER trial, activating the PACER, the RT stayed in the room the whole time, but as soon as we got to sort of 20 plus minutes at a time, it wasn't good value for them to be here. So, okay. so it was a bit of a safety feature. Uh, they uh, have put the is available for me to use okay. if I need to use it type thing. So, if I recall, you were using it about three hours or so at a time. Yeah, I was doing uh, three one-hour sessions. Uh, I was eating on the mouthpiece, uh, talking, uh, basically carrying on with my normal activities on the mouthpiece itself. So essentially, no respiratory support except the mouthpiece. And you That's were able it. To do that for Absolutely. Hours. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and what about uh, airway clearance? What uh, what strategies or devices are you using for that? Yeah, we use the NX machine. If I have uh, secretions uh, that need to be cleared out, uh, typically, on average, it's twice or three times a day. Okay. It's, it's when I want it. I can feel that I have uh, secretions that need to be cleared out. So I will ask for an NX specifically to deal with that. Right. Yeah. And it's pretty effective for you? Oh, yeah, very effective, uh, both in clearing uh, any secretions. Have you tried it at all lungs. through a mask yet? No, I've never used a mask at all. No. Okay. That would be the first step today. Um, and what about uh, lung blowing recruitment? I am doing that. Uh, again, there was a period of time after the operation uh, where I was not allowed to do that for about two weeks. Uh, right, you so suffered a, a, what we call a pneumothorax. A pneumothorax, on uh, the right side. Yeah, so I had a chest tube. Uh, inserted to uh, help with that, uh, but I've been uh, back to uh, doing the uh, LDRs when I do the NX, and I can also breast stack on my diaphragm pacer, so that works as well. Okay, yeah. terrific. But when I first started, my volumes were about uh, 300 at the start, and dropping down to 200 or below 200 by the time I finished. two or three minutes at a time, yeah. I think. Yeah. Eliminated. In fact, when I first started, we would take me off because my SATs dropped to below 92, and in fact, usually by the time I came off, they were about 89. Now my volumes are uh, consistently above 500 when I start, and around 450 when I finish. In fact, we had one session yesterday where my volumes at the end of 30 minutes were, were better than my volumes at the beginning, so I was very pleased with that. So generally, what limits the the um, trial? 
Uh, generally speaking, near kind of raise your eyebrows at this one, but uh, generally speaking, it's the delivery of a meal or whatever. <laughs> More seriously, I do end up, uh, you know, getting a little bit tired. Uh, but. There's, um, as I say, you know, I can go on average 30 minutes during each of the trials during the day, and uh, 50 in the morning. I've done 45 at night, uh, but I, I have not noticed any real difference between being in bed or being in the chair. And your so, sats are now maintained. The sats are being maintained. In fact, they're going up oh, so great. quite often. We start at 94, and I'll finish at 96. So that's okay. Very, very positive. So you're, yeah, you're, yeah. You're doing really, really well, and you're pleased about yeah. your progress. Well, I was really quite disturbed when I when I added activated initially, because I thought I would be able to go longer than two or three minutes. But uh, you know, I've been really quite shocked at how quickly it has yeah. you know, evolved. And I'm very, very yeah. pleased with where I'm at today. That's for sure. Yeah, good for you. It's uh, it's kind of nice breathing on my own without the ventilator. A nice difference. And can you envisage a time when you might be able to get by without the trach entirely? Oh yeah, I can for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, my one major question, which we haven't started to practice yet, is uh, how I might be affected when I'm sleeping. Back to think. Yeah, that, uh, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah it's, uh, that's a step in the process. So try and meet that challenge when yeah. we get there. Yeah. Yeah. We were talking too about the discrepancy between the tidal volumes that you're commonly getting on right. the ventilator yeah. versus the tidal volumes you get on the pacemaker. And there's quite a bit of difference. Difference, yeah, huge, yeah. And yet, from what you're telling me, you don't really detect um, a big difference, that you don't feel like you're air hungry no. when you're on the pacemaker. No. So, and part of that is because some of this volume leaks. It's also leaking when you're talking, so you know on average it's not as big a difference. Um, but I think the ultimate tidal volume is going to be a function of the strength of the diaphragm, okay. the amplitude of the electrical stimulus, okay. and the flexibility of your respiratory system. Okay. And I don't know exactly where that's going to end up. Um, you know, a reasonable tidal volume would probably be, you know, eight to ten mils per kilo. Um, you know, right now we're giving you bigger volumes, that, but that's partly because of the invasive nature of the ventilation okay. and how it allows you to um, leak volume for speech. It allows us to keep the cuff deflated all the time. Yeah. Um, so I can't really answer precisely the goal, but I would think somewhere around 8 to 10 mils per kilo, and, and those would be the limiting okay. factors. But, uh, for example, this morning when I was on the, uh, the diaphragm pacer for 45 minutes when I was going through my morning bath and such, I did not notice any, uh, you know, problems with the volume of air I was getting. I didn't feel like I was challenged in not getting enough air. From that perspective, uh, I'm quite comfortable with The other thing we could do and haven't done yet is um, we could measure your exhaled CO2 mm -hmm. during the pacing sessions uh, because volume is only one function. Okay, yeah. Uh, it's not the same as gas exchange, and oxygen levels can be maintained fairly normally mm -hmm. in terms of saturation, even though CO2 may arise. Okay. So it would certainly give us some reassurance at a given level of tidal volume, say five to 700 cc's, if your CO2 also remains perfectly static, then you're also getting enough ventilation. Right. And so as long as it's sufficient to provide normal gas exchange, any changes would be predicated more on sort of how you're feeling, you know, in terms yeah. of breath volume. Well, one of my questions is related to the next steps, and I know that I'm, a, you know, every patient is unique, but curious as to what the next steps might be. Well, I think the next steps are to, you know, try to superimpose on what you're using now 
entirely non-invasive strategies. Okay. So, uh, as you know, there's a number of patients we care for who, like you, don't have any respiratory function, no spontaneous lung volume at all, and yet they're able to use entirely non-invasive supports. And while you have the capacity to use the PACER, and that will always remain um, you know, an important fundamental component of your breathing, to be able to be confident and comfortable on a non-invasive mask, on mouthpiece during the daytime, right. yeah. uh, using the cough assist device through yeah. a mask rather than the um, tracheostomy tube, uh, in a manner as one would do if they didn't have a tracheostomy. So it's really gradually introducing each of those uh, strategies and therapies. Okay. Is really, the, the the plan and exactly how quickly and how successfully we're going to be at that uh, time will tell. Well, of course, the next challenges. Well, you're certainly the one to achieve it. That's for sure. Thank you. Yeah. Visit our website at www.canventottawa.ca for additional comprehensive information.